Good morning. I have to play with the volume uh, a bit here in my proximity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It was great to see so many people that um, have been here before and are members. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. How many of you guys think of us as a living museum or a museum? Raise your hand if yes. Yeah, they're a little slower, right? <laughs> um, I consider myself um, a, a transplant from the art museum world, so I learned a lot when I first landed in the garden setting, this gardenscape. Um, for museum practice and all of you collections people and I know there are some museum folks in the, the audience um, will be amazed to know that every plant is accessioned. Deaccessioning is easier because if a plant dies it is deaccessioned. Um, but if you have a chance to walk around our garden galleries right now do think about those plants in that way. They are engaging for the public, they're um, sharing scientific facts and ideas with people but they're also museum collections and then we operate our temporary exhibitions within that. Um, as I was thinking about fantasy my mind went a variety of places okay. Um, but when I was thinking about how that relates to what we're doing, as um, Amy said briefly, so often we think of fantasy as being completely disparate from the, the world that we're operating within and marching through. And so that's kind of um, the area that we're going to walk through today. Um, Another important caveat that as we get to the Q&A part especially, when you think of my title and the role that I occupy here, um, if you see a fabulous plant you love, please don't ask me what it is because I will not know for you. I can find my smart... What happened? I'm not sure. <laughs> the voice of God is saying, do not ask her, really, don't. Uh, um, no, but you know what? I think we will go to plan B and use your handheld so we can avoid that entertainment in the future. Everyone's awake. Hello. <laughs> you go ahead and leave that on, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Just a couple of All right. Just a small technical hiccup. Everyone else? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> The problem is I flail, but I will try not to fling the, the microphone um, as we move forward. So again, thinking about fantasy, the everyday world, they're really not that divorced from one another. And I think we, as the folks that somehow identify with creative industries or as a creative, we are the lucky ones that see the world in a different way. And I think our job, and we'll talk a little bit about that, or I will, and hopefully you'll comment on it at the end, um, our job is to really crack open that door to bring more followers and enthusiasts through that. So that's what we'll be looking at in part. Um, again, going back to the notion of fantasy, when Amy was first describing what the nature of the talk should be, um, my mind went a variety of places, and as I'm going through my visual vocabulary and files in my brain, for some reason I thought of this work by Manet, and specifically if you look at the upper left, you see the feet of some trapeze person, which if you're not looking closely, you don't really know, but for some reason I particularly harvested this image and was thinking, you know, what is happening in this, in this world? I'm not quite sure. Um, and then, of course, I was thinking, do I have to talk about Toulouse-Lautrec and Moulin Rouge and what was happening and all of that? No, that's just a bit of where my mind went. And we're going to start in a second here to give you a little bit of context as to how I got to where I am in this world. This is not a biographical um, talk, so rest assured. But I think so often we skip that part of what builds to an understanding for a person a place, and then especially on the art side, when you're involving artists and that visual communication, we expect that people are gonna get to that end result and we've not pulled them along the journey from the beginning. So now you will get a glimpse into my, my scary upbringing, if you will, um, and through the lens of fantasy, what were those early influences that as a kiddo trying to figure out what they love, what they wanna be when they grow up, all of those things that I was doing in the Midwest um, very long ago now. It was things like this that took me to another world. I really, really wanted to be on the Millennium Falcon. 
daily for a long time. Forget Princess Leia, I just wanted to be next to Han Solo. It didn't matter. <laughs> and then things like this, if you think of that visual eye candy that now, however many decades later, through technology, you know, George Lucas is reinventing Star Wars and then JJ, JJ I've lost, Abrams, yes, thank you. Um, but early on, those low-tech visuals that were just so lush and full of color. So on the top left, um, Dorothy, when she finally made it to Oz. At the bottom left, you have the original Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder. I so wanted to eat candy mushrooms and swim in that chocolate river, doing the backstroke, ideally avoiding the tube that the guy got stuck in. Um, <laughs> And then on the right, fabulous Dr. Seuss, who invented names, critters, machines, people. All of that is innovation and fantasy land that I wanted to create for myself um, and operate within. And then, of course, the Jetsons, the futuristic get me to work with that little briefcase that hovers above I-70 traffic, please. That's what I want to do. Um, so all of that is in my brain. My parents were great. They knew I loved art from an early age, enrolled me in art classes, talk, um, taught at local colleges in Michigan. Um, my skill set was not fabulous, but they exposed me nonetheless. And then thinking about this um, as reference to the workplace, you, you finally have to decide what you're going to be when you grow up, right? Um, so anyone that is tied to an art teacher just give them a big hug, because I would say my um, high school art teacher, believe it or not, really inspired me to get where I am. And short story there, we, a number of us um, in my junior year, had taken every single studio art class possible, and she really wanted to teach art history. And I was like, that's a thing? Art history is real? OK, that makes sense. I guess art is made a long time ago. Um, as you might imagine, raise your hand, first of all, if you loved freshman year art history in college. Those hands were slower and fewer, for those of you who did not do the head count. Um, think dark room slides. I was hooked immediately. For me, art, art present, and art history, it is every discipline out there. It is politics, it is science, it is sociology, it is psychology all of those things, so I couldn't get away from it. All of my friends, you might imagine, not so much. So I did flail through college as well. Not only do I do that speaking, but finding my way. Um, I decided to focus on arts administration after trying to be a graphic designer. I did not enjoy that, and I love Nick and Noreen here at the gardens, if you've not met them. Um, and those of you who are designers, um, you don't get to always make your own decisions, do you? That whole client thing, whether internal or external, <laughs> sometimes gets in the way of the vision. Um, so anyway, this might seem crazy I'm showing you the pictures that are up here, these Paleolithic images. Um, but I land in a place after grad school, getting my art history degree on top of arts administration, and I land a teaching gig at a university, and I'm gonna convert the world to love art history. They need to know the facts about these things, why we think they're made, what the interpretation is, when they were made, because that's what they need. And then I'm put in a position as the lowly adjunct faculty person to teach an 8 a.m. Art 101 <laughs> course. Awesome. To basically business students that are freshmen. That is a wicked, fabulous combination. People who don't want to be there, they're checking off the list. OK, this is my humanities elective. I'm human. I really don't think I need to be in a class dedicated to the humanities. And what, um, what I quickly realized is, again, you're trying to teach. This is for those of you um, who have barred it from your mind if you were exposed long ago, or if you've not seen it, the Venus of Villendorf. She looks extra um, voluptuous because she's really only about four inches tall, if you um, remember. Um, and if I'm getting my dates right, both of these works and then the paintings at Lascaux on the right, um, between 22,000, um, 15,000 15, BCE. But as I jump in to start in here and then trying to teach these students all the way through contemporary art, 
Um, there's no context or language for that. They have no skills at even looking at things around them, none. Um, and it might seem like I'm overshooting that a bit, but there was really no context. And I think we still do that today, even as museum centers and learning centers and creatives. We expect people to get to the penthouse, but we don't crack open that door to creativity and to imagination. There needs to be a set of stairs to venture up slowly, go back down if I'm uncomfortable, go back up when I'm feeling industrious, and then there's an elevator if I need it, right? Just bring me to the top. I don't need this stuff on the lower floor. So I think we can look around at our environment as the catalyst for that. Um, and early, early, pre-humans basically did the same thing. This ability to recognize something around you. Um, this is a pebble, roughly about the same size as the Venus actually, about four inches big or so. Have any of you seen this before? Seen this before? Just one, great. Um, it's a pebble found in South Africa, and I am not an anthropologist or um, a paleontologist, but near Australopithecus africanus, right? pre-human that we know. And why this is interesting is where this kind of jasperite stone was found naturally was very far away from where it was found next to the remains of this genus. So what that indicates then, and you can dispute it and hit the Googles, and there's different interpretations, of course, but there was recognition that that looked like a face, most likely, and they were inspired to have something that they could treasure and bring it with him or her and keep with them. So they're looking around their environment and inspiring themselves and others, perhaps. Thinking about the caves at Lascaux, same kind of thing. And as we think, too, about creativity and the tools to um, get there, so I'm going between fantasy, imagination, and creativity, a bit as synonyms, though there's subtleties there. And then fantasy, imagination are synonymous. So often as we talk to visitors in the garden, people say, well, I'm not quite sure I want to use my phone. If I want technology, I'll haul it out. And anecdotally, and then even from visitor data, people are using their phone in the gardens. And I bring that up right now is because about 90% of the pictures you will see, and I'm not a photographer, are taken with a phone. It's a lens for us to document and be inspired by and share with each other, just like the hashtag encouragement and all of that. And then though our visitors through data collection indicate, well, I don't know if I'm going to use my phone for information. I want to be able to um, access info from you through our web app, et cetera. But I'm also then going to use that as my microscope, my magnifying glass, to notice things around me. So that, I think, is a great tool for us. So what you're looking at is just this idea that everything around us, if we look at those small details, opens the door for bigger ideas when it comes to fantasy. It can get me thinking. And I would say, too, that when I say natural world, I'm including, for fun and grins, um, the built environment, that so-called architectural um, cityscape or other that we build for ourselves. Um, fairly recently, um, colleagues and I met with an artist named Boaz Vadia, and he was articulating that humans, just like birds making a nest, are creating their living environments, and that's a natural process. So our cityscapes and built environments are perhaps just as natural for us as a species as it is for others in the true, the wilds, the natural. And so I include these kinds of things that just noticing can cause me to look at the beautiful um, world around us. I won't define beautiful, that's a whole other Creative Mornings talk, right? Um, but what that might mean for me Again, just these glimpses, going back to this Art 101 class, this is where I went with them. I'm like, okay, let's forget formal analysis of a painting for a minute. Um, if I can notice things around me and create a bit of a fantasy land, um, notice that the smoke billowing out of a factory as I'm stuck in highway traffic looks amazing in the sunrise light. Perhaps things like um, 
political commentary or deadlines at work can kind of sit off to the side for a minute and I can live in my own fantasy land. And if I am a creative already, how can I take that and use it to inspire me? Um, it was interesting as I was shuffling through imagery that might articulate some of my um, point here. I clearly have an issue taking, the picture, taking pictures of the same thing over and over. So shadows, pathways leading into nowhere, um, all of you designers um, or artists that are draftsmen, anything with linear perspective, apparently I find very interesting. Um, and again, it's everywhere. This is, I mean, they kind of look like advertisements. I'm not um, espousing vegetables necessarily, but just to show you, articulate where we could find these glimmers of fantasy. And again, thinking about someone who does not have the vocabulary or exposure or experience already, the ability to take something like this and open the door for them, I think is something we can all do. So on the left is here at the gardens um, in a nexus garden on the west, some cabbage. And then in the center is at Whole Foods. My son took that shot while we were grocery shopping. And then on the right in Chicago at a bakery where I wanted every one of those little piggies to come home with me. <laughs> but again, I come with it with some of this background already. And um, this is from the opening slide. Again, going back to this idea that when we think of fantasy, it has to be Star Wars or something completely outside of reality. Or when I'm talking about art and I want people to analyze and understand an abstract painting, I want them to be there. But I could start with something like this. I'm so tempted to have you guys guess what it is, but we won't have time for that. So I will jump to the conclusion for you. Um, this is actually the top of a cake box at Cold Stone Creamery that, again, my son took when he noticed these ice crystals forming on an M&M ice cream cake with his phone. Um, and so apparently I have warped him already, right, for how he walks through the world. He's playing soccer and then looking at me pointing at the clouds because they're fabulous. So that's good, but you can go too far at an early age, so I guess you have to stage it. And then again, I can talk about this with people who might be afraid of art fantasy, but it's shadows on pavement that I just snapped. But if I put up a Franz Klein painting next to it, big black strokes on a white canvas, the end result from an analysis standpoint, not getting into interpretation, but observing, repeating, it's really the same process, but this is far less scary for people. And here at the gardens, we have this fabulous opportunity. Um, and we didn't just arrive at this conversation because I wanna share information about artist intent, about the context for those artworks. But I also think that it's important for just art to be for people, for fantasy to be created by that visitor or that person that's understanding the art for the first time or for the 15th time. Same concept here, basically an abstract painting. It just happens to be pavement. And then as I get familiar with the world around me, I can start to manipulate it again. So again, thank you cell phone and son. This is him um, taking a picture of himself. And then here again also, the idea suddenly I wanna change vantage points of the natural world and with it. So he's actually shooting up, looking to the sky and his little head is the strange form in the bottom right. And then art informs life and life informs art, right? And it becomes hard to tell which comes first. It's definitely the chicken and the egg. Going back to some of those earlier examples, this is a shot from the original Alice in Wonderland, right? I was always enthralled with the idea of playing with scale, how you know, suddenly some of those visual cartoons, you're the size of an ant looking up at something enormous. And then again, you can play with that in real life too. And then maybe if I start here, whether I'm an observer or creator or participant, I can get somewhere else as well. And then it's kind of fun for me selfishly because as I walk around the gardens, when I see daffodils, I'm thinking of things like this. Again, that's just part of my visual vocabulary. But if we as creatives um, can create those opportunities for others, um, I think the 
not to sound overly altruistic, the world will be a better place, regardless of who's running it, correct? Yes. And then two, this idea artists and designers are looking at the things around them, but I feel sometimes as though I'm waving at friends when I walk around the gardens, um, noticing small details like ice forming on grass, it sometimes takes longer to get from A to B, but in the end, it's fine. And these are some of my friends that I noticed. Um, I decided I needed to name them, but as you wander the gardens, and I hope you will, because it should be nice out, um, this picture to the left, if you walk straight out, it'll be to your left. Those white, that look like little antlers to me, um, those white flowers are no longer there, but everything can be anthrop anthropomorphized, right? And then sometimes friends gather in a choir and sing around the lead singer. And then two, you can manipulate perspective, get up, down, low. And again, this is the natural world. It's a good starting place for someone who's not used to thinking about things differently. Our conservatory is Alice in Wonderland incarnate, basically. Um, nature does wonderful things for us without us having to insert ourselves. So how can I, if I'm going to be the, the next filmmaker creating the next avatar, how can I look around me for inspiration to the real science, the real nature to create the fantastical? I think we really can start here. What does that mean for the idea of art and landscape and nature coming together? Our goal from the exhibition standpoint here at the gardens is something like this, really that ideal juxtaposition that serves um, natural environment, artist, and artwork as best possible. And people take what they want with and from that. Um, just to give you a quick note, that is Large Reclining, reclining Figure by Henry Moore, um, a Deborah Butterfield sculpture. And then sometimes, too, you can use natural materials, a site-specific work by Tetsunori Kawana, to transform what exists in the natural environment you're playing with. And then one great thing that is a mixed blessing for some of our artists or museum partners, um, nature steps in, and the unique part about an outdoor gallery setting is that she gets her way and changes what that vision can look like. That dynamism and tension is really an important element of art here in the gardens that really we need to embrace because Mother Nature wins. This is um, a work by Nancy Lovendahl that we're installing in the first week of May. Does that look like May? <laughs> yes, in Colorado that looks like May. Um, and so our, the woman on the right is the artist Nancy Lovendahl. This is Spiral Dance. Um, and we were sprinting to get this temporary installation in the snow um, the day before the opening or something like that, as, as it so happens. But that's the novelty. You have to give part of that away. And then, again, this is an artwork by Linda Fleming, Refugium. The artist comes in with his or her vision. We put it in a context. It's not in a white box gallery. So we've added our own level of fantasy, perhaps and then it changes throughout its duration here and takes on new meaning for others and allows people to explore that artwork and that art space. This is meant to go in and truly be like a refuge in a way that um, if you're inside of an, an art gallery with ceilings and walls, you don't quite have the same opportunity. So how do we get to this end product vision? That is kind of the, the top of the, the penthouse I was talking about. You're able to understand artists. It's a perfect presentation. Um, but going back to this, noticing the details along the way, and a bit like the idea that we want to live in the moment and appreciate those details of getting there. It's hard to do. Um, the same sensibility can be applied to doing the work that gets to that final product. So even if you are a graphic designer in that cafe by yourself, the ability to notice those things around you that can inform your work, perhaps some surprise. Um, this is one of our favorite things to do here at the gardens is lay down the yellow brick road of plywood. Dorothy is not on the other side of that. Um, though my colleagues and I wish we could click our heels and magically install sculpture. Um, it doesn't happen that way, 
But I include it not because of the behind the scenes glimpse, but the idea of shadows playing across a messy area that's still, for instance, what I see when I look at it. And it's very similar to this. Um, that again, if I wanted to talk about abstract painting with someone, I could do something like this as a starting point, perhaps. And then you get to the messiness of getting something in. And it's, it's busy, it's challenging. But along the way, you get these views that not everyone is privy to. I have no doubt some of you or others, someone was asking me about plants. What do you do if someone touches the plants? Um, what do you do if someone touches the art? My message is, don't touch the art. Um, but on the right-hand side, you see a detail of Deborah Butterfield's work. And if you're familiar with it or you saw that exhibition, number one question is, is that wood? No, it's bronze. No, really, is that wood? Really, it's bronze. And then it results in touching, says the person who does not want you to touch the artwork. But this idea, again, of finding those vantage points and viewpoints that you might not usually stumble across unless you're pausing or looking at the world around you, um, on a, it, it does beg to touch, if you will. And then I thought I'd include this because just to reiterate the point, we're marching along doing this work and we turn around here at the gardens and it's impossible to work here at the gardens and not be inspired. Again, disclaimer, I am not a horticulture um, professional. That's what I will say. Um, but to turn around, literally, and things are intense, you're installing sculpture, you turn around and see this, this is fantasy world. My imagination kicks into gear right here because I'm going to go into some golden secret path, secret opening, maybe where fairies or Willy Wonka's chocolate factory really is. And that's what adults and kids love about being here at the gardens. Even as we chat with visitors, the idea of getting intentionally lost or for a moment, they're not quite sure where they are and they're not going to um, be lost for days out in the mountains. It's safety, but um, opportunity to get away. And then artists play with that too. I know Patrick Merrill spoke to this group um, and this is his work, Stepped Mound. Again, it's so fun for us to have an artist then do the same thing that we do as we look around the landscape, noticing those details. If you heard him talk, that's very much his perspective, even looking at an environment, thinking about that changeability. And again, this is the, the end product. Another vantage point of that end product that might not be an artist's vision for what they um, had in mind for someone experiencing it. And then I think the process of getting to that is just as much part of the art and fantasy portion of it. Um, so that idea of process and messiness that leads to fantasy once again. And then going back to the, A, the devil's in the details, but the beauty's in the details too. Um, so I'm just showing you a couple of up close shots of um, this time sculpture, but treated in the same way, that idea of looking at something, it becomes abstracted and perhaps then fantastical, to use that descriptor. Um, I would have to ask my colleagues what the detail on the left is because I can't recognize it. But on the right is um, a sculpture by George Siegel, Walking Man's Foot. And then the top of a Henry Moore sculpture. So to, to flip something, clearly Henry Moore, who moved his stuff around a lot, um, was understanding that to walk around a piece and to have three-dimensional perspective is essential, but not many of our visitors get to see the top of the head of a 10-foot figure, so you get to see that texture. And if I zoom in there and get rid of all the context, it is abstracted and becomes even more fantastical. And then, again, just a, a quick example. This is an, um, an earlier exhibition that celebrated street art, graffiti art. I can take inspiration and then enliven the world around me. So this is artist Lady Pink in a studio setting. She created murals for us. But um, in that intentional way, trying to create a fantasy world out of our kind of very contrived, structured world, artists can do that with intent. And if we can encourage people to legally um, take that into their hands and create around them, 
I think that we can encourage more people to get to a place of creating fantasy for a positive outcome. So I think we should look at the details. Again, something like this topic and this kind of take on nature and fantasy is never ending. I think I was shooting photos up until the moment I came in. Um, but I really think that you guys especially, and we that already have a little bit of a glimmer at what fantasy can be in reality, can open the doors. So thank you guys for being here. That's my two cents.